Hey guys, welcome to Multitasker. I'm Joe Frosto, CEO and founder of Multitasker, a marketplace where we unite homeowners and the best service providers in your area. But today I wanna to welcome you to our podcast. It's called the Home Solutions Network Podcast. And we're gonna be introducing the top service providers, clients that have used our marketplace, and some of the people that direct this company, and very exciting stories. The goal of the podcast is to save you time, save you money, give you insights, give you tips, and create value for your home. So come on in and let's check it out. Hello everyone, welcome to Multitasker Home Solution Network podcast, a marketplace where we unite homeowners and service providers. In this episode, I'm sitting down with Lindsay Wood, also known as the Tiny Home Lady, CEO of Experience Tiny Homes. Hey there. <laughs> hey Lindsay. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so our, our audience can get to know you a bit better. Can you please share a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Who's, who's Lindsay? Hey, who's Lindsay? Okay. Uh, back in 1970, when I, <laughs> So yes, I'm a 70s baby and fast forwarding to, I would say 2003 in the green MBA program that was the first in the country is where I really got my sustainability bug. Nice. And it was after a road trip around the world in India and Nepal and almost a near death experience really awakened to something different in the world. And we had yet to see and hear really of climate change and you know, inconvenient truth and all these things that happen. But I was really on a path of what do we need to do for the planet? What are some of the aspects that, you know, really go into it? So I got my green MBA and I love dance. I love nature. I love just, you know, in, in enjoying friends and family and community. But I'm also the person that is always talking about, you know, recycling and being green and living a healthy lifestyle. Uh, it is, you know, health is your wealth. So the whole journey towards going tiny uh, was just a big path. You know, I was background in biodiesel for a while. It's known as Betty Biodiesel. And then in the LED lighting career, I was the LED lady. So no question. I was like, who am I going to be in the tiny home world? And the tiny home lady just stuck. Awesome. That's great. So let's dive into that journey, right? So yeah. tiny homes. So since 2018, you have lived in a tiny home, uh, allowing you to travel throughout the U.S., so how many states did you check out and what did you love about that experience? So we went from California out to Texas, banked back up through Colorado and back to California. That was after we, you know, basically our, our journey started in Marin County where we were living. My husband and I lived there for about seven years. What year was that? Uh, that was in, well, we had, we met in 2010. Okay. And then. In 2017, after $108,000 paying in rent, we realized we no longer wanted to pay someone else's equity. And we started looking for property. We started looking, well, in the Marin area, it's very expensive. You know, your starter home, one two bedroom home, or a two bedroom home, about a million dollars. We didn't feel like we wanted to jump into that. Even though we were making six figures to collectively, it just was not in the cards. And then even even land was getting outbid. You know, it was definitely an outbidding kind of world there. So we then took our sights into the tiny home world and we found a builder. We flew out to Arlington, Texas for the first tiny home festival, found a builder. We we're really excited. And about six months later, they gave us the dreadful call of we are no longer in business. Come and pick up your unfinished tiny home. Oh, wow. So we went from custom tiny home builder to surprise DIY. And we spent the next eight months, that was around the 2018 year, pretty much all that year, finishing our tiny home. And then we hit the road. But we didn't get too far. Two, two days into our travel, we had to change out our axles and our tires. And that really opened up, you know, the, the electrical, the plumbing, all the things that we had to do and change with the builder that we trusted to build our home. You know, it's an unregulated industry. They don't have to be general contractors. There's no, you know, licensing. There's no, we didn't ask for someone that was bonded and insured or any of that. So we learned, no, nope. we were, we were certified, but we were really unsure of the whole certification thing as well. I mean, we were so fresh and green. So from that experience, we then hit the road and we went to like 12 festivals that year with our tiny home. Mm -hmm. And it was a blast to like, just show people, but we had yet to figure out where our place in this industry was. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, it's 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 such a new industry, right? Where yes. like there's there's everybody's hearing a lot about oh the ADUs and what is an ADU or a granny flat or or mobile home or a tiny home, right? And so um, yeah, tiny homes are starting to get more and more buzz. Like I've been hearing more about it, right? Uh, but to people that don't know what is a tiny home, let's let's do tiny home one one. Right? Yes. What what is a tiny home? Absolutely. Is it another unit? Is it a house? What What is it? It's a little confusing because you just said the word ADU, accessory dwelling unit, is essentially a smaller home. Now, we know ADUs can go up to 800, 1200 square feet. But typically, I would say, and you probably know this more, what are on average people going for? Like under 1000 square feet is what I think an accessory dwelling unit is. In relationship to the 2,500 square foot average size of an American home, that's a smaller home or what we would call a tiny home. But I think where most people think about tiny homes are the ones on wheels. Now, we have this longstanding history of this industry called the park model, the RV park model. It's been around for decades. It's what we used to call mobile home. Then it turned into manufactured home, but there's still a certification for RV park model. So the tiny home on wheel industry is largely building to the RV park model standard because we do not have our own lane. We don't have our own standards yet. I'm part of the tiny home industry association and we're working together collectively with a group of builders that are in this industry, building this industry to create the beginnings of that standard. And so it will help everyone to understand, you know, is it a movable tiny home? Because A home that's built on foundation that's 400 square feet is a tiny home. A home that's built on wheels that's under 400 square feet is a tiny home as well. But some are movable and more movable than others. You know, your RV park models can get up to 13 wide. Those are not commonly movable. They're portable to their location. They get, you know, set, skirted, and probably left there for the rest of their life. But with tiny homes, eight and a half wide, which is what ours is, by 33 feet long, with a gooseneck hitch, which is similar to like a horse trailer hitch, we travel that thing around like a fifth wheel. And so a lot of people, so we're, we, we always say, we have an RV from the trailer down and a home from the trailer up. Oh, wow. So we're blending and hybridizing that world of home, the two by four, two by six construction, insulation with the wheels underneath it. Mm. And then how, how, um, are you having, do you have any issues when you travel, like parking it somewhere or? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we (laughs) do know where to go. Yeah. We, we started out our trip. We were new. So we chose a lot of the RV parks. Okay. We only ran into a couple that said, Nope, tiny homes are not allowed. Even though you look around, like we could pull in, we have a cab over camper on our truck. When we're not towing our tiny home, we have one of those. We could pull into those same RV parks and park that, but not our $100,000 luxury tiny home. Oh, wow. It was just a weird, I think people, including RV parks, had to get their heads around it. Certifications, all that. A lot of them really looked at the RVIA sticker on the side of every RV you see. What they don't know is that that RV is adhering to either a national fire protection, either agency or NFPA 1192, or the ANSI A119.5 code. And same too, will a tiny home be certified to that same exact standard? However, it looks different. It's got siding, it's got square windows, it's got uh, the mechanical equipment on the back, not on the top. So it looks very different. But that's also a plus because a lot of places around the country are approving them as homes and backyards like ADUs. So we get to now start blending that world of being able to be portable and movable. Um, For us, we, with California and all the fires, we actually were in a place where we had to be evacuated and we took our whole home with us versus being concerned that our home's going to go up in flames. Yeah. Yeah. Big plus for people, you know, and why they want, they want that beautiful home feel. They want, you know, the quartz countertop and the bathtub and the, all those amenities but they also want it to be portable. Right. Sounds great. It sounds like there's a lot of advantages to it. You just have to really understand what it is, right? Exactly. Understanding what it is and navigating the world of the industry and who's building it, all those things is really where I I focus on with my company, Experience Tiny Homes. So as a tiny home owner, what, what have you learned? As an owner, what I've learned is 
less is more. Mm -hmm. Um, have a place for everything and everything in its place. This really gets into simplicity because if you don't really have a place for something, it's going to end up as a clutter mm -hmm. somewhere else. You know, it just just like in a bigger home, but you just have less space to do it in. Um, we've even gone as far as when we're we're situated, we have a gooseneck that juts out over the truck. Well, when we're not traveling it, we wrap that underneath. We call it the gooseneck garage. Mm -hmm. So we literally store things in there, much like you would put a storage unit. Nice. But having, you know, awareness around if you got too much stuff and you're just kind of stepping over things, you really want to reduce. I call that essentialism. What is essential that I need? I needed a bathtub. I wanted to put that in. I really wanted to have storage so that if friends come over, I might have an air mattress or um, right now we're Airbnb in our tiny home. So we're using that gooseneck garage a lot, putting it to work. How are people, are people liking it? Oh, yes. Yeah. They love the Airbnb tiny home experience. You don't get a lot of those out there. You know, a lot of tiny homes are in parks or even villages, and that's not really, you know, welcomed in terms of Airbnb. They want to create community. I totally get that. But in our situation, we have the type of landlord that's, you know, said yes to having it on Airbnb. And who knows, with all the Airbnb changes and everything, we'll see. But people really like the ability to to live in one you know, when you go to festivals, thousands of people flock to these festivals and shows and they can walk in one for maybe 10 minutes mm -hmm. and then leave. But really staying in one and being able to feel like, is this space big enough for me? It may not be the layout I like, but does this work? Sounds cool. How big is your tiny home? Ours is 300 square feet, including the loft, which I always make sure I do because it's another space. Um, and we have an upstairs office room and then we even have a crawl in closet wow yep that's a little interesting not everyone's into that so you know i always say teach their own tiny homes are highly customizable the whole industry was built off of customization man well 300 sounds small and then when you say you have all that space then you customize it very in a very smart way right. a very efficient way and a lot of people when they walk in because we've literally counted and this is being conservative ten thousand people through our tiny home and the most common comment we get is, oh, it feels bigger than I would have thought because we have 11 foot ceilings. Um, and then over the loft, you can stand at 6'3 underneath the loft. And then going up into the gooseneck, probably maybe six feet or so. So it feels really big when you walk in and everything's white. That really keeps the opening. Exactly. We've added some texture. Nice. So I made you so passionate about tiny homes. Why, why the tiny home lady, right? affordability i would say the biggest one we are in a crisis like beyond crisis just california alone three million homes shortage and in san diego right where we're at roughly is about twenty thousand shortage that all affects and impacts you know to what we see the tent cities the homeless encampments the you know it all rolls down or you don't you may not see people that are struggling at least on the street that you can visibly see but what about the people that are paying 30 to 50% of their income on housing? What's left over for, oops, what happens if a medical happens? What happens if, you know, what about sending my kid to college? What about retirement, right? That gets, retirement gets pushed away if you need to just survive. You know, forget the vacation and all of that, right? So really, I think a big move and what's so exciting, people have really said, do I really need this much? And you know, from the millennials to the boomers, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. I get it. If you've got a family of four or five and, you know, you might need space, but the beauty of tiny homes, it's flexible. You know, you're a millennial, you move into a tiny home, you're not really desiring a big yard yet. Whereas maybe when you have kids, that's the time in your life where you have a little bit more space in a yard. And then when you're in that, you know, older part of your life, you're saying, I don't really want to take care of this much landscaping. Or I'd like to have my grandma in my backyard to be closer to family or be able to have a rental unit so I can, you know, keep the cost down on my mortgage. That's a great point. So, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming those are part of the of the advantages of having a tiny home, right? So Absolutely. is there any more advantages that you can share with the audience? There's a top four reasons. So financial is big, you know, and people like home ownership is really, you know, I put that in the financial category, but that's a pride category. That's a dignity. That's like saying for those that want the equity and to feel home ownership, 
You know, that's that's like the, the ultimate American dream, right? That's the dream we've been sold on forever. It's the dream I was sold on. So to actually have the ability to have a piece of that pie, you know, the piece of American dream pie um, is really where number one. Number two is simplicity. To be able to say, I just have, I'm tired of the, the cluttered garage. I can't even park my car in it, right? And then of course, portability. You might put it in the word travel, but not too many people travel with the tiny home. They're heavier. Um, they're not, you know, if you really want to travel and move somewhere every few weeks, an RV is great. They're lightweight. They're built for that. But for people that say, you know, I'd like to be somewhere for a few years and then pick up and then go somewhere else. Works great for military people that want to, you know, retain their home. And, and then the final one is really lowering your footprint, sustainability, being lighter on the planet. That's where the green MBA comes in. That's right. right. <laughs> Go <laughs> nice. green. Yes, 100%. So regarding disadvantages, right? Yes. What, what would be the biggest disadvantages to have tiny homes everywhere or to have it, make it more accessible for people? What, what would be the biggest disadvantages? There's a think? lot of layers to that one. So I'm going to compartmentalize that answer to personally, the disadvantage, I go up and down a loft. I don't think I always want to go up and down a loft. I know a lot of people that come into our tiny home like, nope, that's not my knees, my, you know, back or my, you know, ability. They just don't want to do it. So that would be an area where me personally, I could see moving into a different home just because I got into a tiny home does not mean that's the last home you're ever going to own, right? I'm assuming you can probably change the layout, right? You can it, totally yeah, change the layout. Yeah. I really like the fact that we can pop up a table to allow, it's a six foot table to put six people around it. And so that's a multifunctional furniture aspect that wouldn't work with stairs that go down into the, go from the ground up because it kind of ends up right in that space. So if we were to say, you know what, we're not going to have that many people over, we'll do stairs instead. I'd just rather go get another tiny home. I mean, I'm so into them, like I'm already designing four nice. in my brain every day. <laughs> so the other one, you know, is just a smaller space. If you want to have a lot of people over and all of that, you know, hopefully you have a big deck, right? The other one in terms of disadvantages, much like the shirt I'm wearing, says legalized tiny. They're not legal in a lot of places because of those little pesky wheels. It's kind of thrown a lot of elected officials into a little quagmire around, well, wait a minute, it's an RV. But we've been able to write ordinances, the Tiny Home Industry Association, to the effect of, you know, dual pane windows, siding, no mechanical equipment on the roof, and really, you know, distinguish a tiny home on wheel or a movable tiny home separate from a recreational vehicle. Okay. And that is the way that we've been able to get so many places, at least here in California, passed. Mm -hmm. You know, the list is long. We got Fresno, City of Fresno, City of Los Angeles, San Diego. Uh, we also have City of San Jose and then County of Santa Clara, County of Humboldt. And then we also just had the state of Maine approve tiny homes. Nice. So really big wins and more and more are adopting every day. But it's really a matter of getting the right kind of standards in place so that we have our own um, lane. We've been using the park model standard, but those are really for temporary living. Yeah. Or you're going to live in a RV park that's got the zoning for that. So that's one of the biggest disadvantages um, for people wanting a tiny home they know they want it but i can't do it because it's not been legalized in my yeah. area well, it's yet. always when it's something new it's always like that right and people like to feel like they can put you in a box right so yes. they go oh okay so it's like an rv or or it's a it's a mobile home right and and so it starts but it's all about just moving forward and trying to remove the status quo right yes. and, and changing and it and stigmas you know the trailer park mm -hmm. the you know, back in World War II, there was a big push to put a lot of people, they had to house a lot of people right after the war. Mm -hmm. And so there was the the move to manufactured housing, but it was a quick move. And we can all see from the quality, you know, the kind of thinness of the wall, all of that really created that stigma. Well, it is not your grandma and grandpa's mobile home anymore. It is, you know, two by six construction, quartz countertop. I have a steam room shower in my tiny home, <laughs> you know, with a raindrop shower. <laughs> that is probably the biggest compliment I get from my Airbnb guests is they love the raindrop shower. Nice. You know, not something you'd commonly find in maybe a trailer, mm -hmm. right? If you're thinking of that word. Mm -hmm. But what is really a trailer? It's a home that moves. Exactly. And now we've just put a lot of architectural 
design to it. You know, I think that's what I love about multitasker is your ability to virtually render the immersive experience for someone to pick and choose everything before, you know, the materials are even bought and the, the chop saws and the hammers come out. Yeah. People are visual, you know, I, I forgot where I read it, but it was like, they were saying that before Pinterest and Instagram and all that, it was like about 70% of people are visual. Yes. And then after, because of Pinterest and Instagram and all that, it it's up to like 80 something percent oh, now. Yeah. Because you're just so accustomed to see what you're going to get before you get it, right? Absolutely. Immediate gratification. And so that's one of the things that people love what what we're doing is that they can see what what is going to happen before it happens, right? And so it removes a lot of that uncertainty out of the picture. And I've so, done it. And it is yeah. so cool. It is so trippy to like reach out like you're about to pull a drawer, but you're not, but you are there. Nice. Well, we're going to show you some other oh, stuff yeah. down after we're done talking, but great, great. So how have you utilized your firsthand experience with your own business? Yeah, because of the whole builder, you know, going out of business and mm -hmm. us taking eight months of our life to transform and, and, you know, take a home that really needed some upgrades. Like the plumbing wasn't done correctly. The electrical, we have a solar system on the roof. We really had to learn a lot. Now we did hire the right professionals for that because we knew we've, we've been flipping homes for five years and we knew like I can put in flooring, I can install a toilet, but I'm not, you know, doing electrical and plumbing and roofing and all of that. So from that experience, I realized, wow, are there anyone else like me that caught was caught completely off guard? Now I realize not everyone has my experience, but just the whole process of even going out to hire a builder. In this industry, you are going direct to manufacture. You know, I always like to explain, like when you buy a car, you don't go direct to Toyota. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to the dealer. Mm -hmm. You don't get to go direct to the manufacturer and customize your car. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and even if there are customizations, you're still working with the dealer mm -hmm. in the tiny home industry, you're going direct to manufacture. You know, we are going to see a big change in the future, because if you look at the park model and manufactured part of this industry, there there's dealers, you work through the dealer, you order your thing, and then the dealer works to the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So because you're so up close with that builder a lot of builders come from the background of building regular homes you know here in california they know california building code mm -hmm. and then they think okay let's just go build it on a trailer right what could be different different standard you got to make sure you're dealing with hurricane resistant winds and earthquake you know reality because you are driving that down the road because you're going to be dealing with different weather depending where you go that's true yeah i mean you we've taken that thing 70 miles per hour down the road hit a pothole you know, I thought for sure the fan was on the ground, but no, it was still intact, yeah. you know, and, but not every builder knows the right kind of, you know, tie downs for that, that attachment of the frame to the trailer. Not every builder is building with that integrity of making sure they're really building it, you know, to a quality. So um, that's a big issue. And so for us, you know, I wanted to kind of gather all the things that I knew. And so I started with one-on-one -on -one consulting. Okay. I found some people who said, yeah, I want a tiny home and I have no idea. So I'm like, all right, let's go through the process. I transformed that whole thing one-on-one -on -one into an academy called the Go Tiny Academy. Nice. It's a 10-week program. We go from, you know, six steps on the tiny home journey. It starts with the dream that people have. Why are you going tiny? And then we look at the 30,000 foot view. Uh, we talk about plan. What's your plan? Do you already know where you're going to park it? Do you know who's going to build it? You know, do you need financing for it? Then we move into design and there's at least, you know, there's seven stages. You can go from hundred percent DIY to a hundred percent custom. And there are seven different like things along that line from DIY to kit, to shell, to dry in shell, to model to customize model to to custom full custom mm -hmm. a lot of people have no idea all those stages so i didn't know right i mean you know so i just kind <laughs> yeah. of laid it out I me mean, look yeah. at all these yeah. stages and so for people that want a hybrid diy and they want someone else to build the framing and do all the electrical and plumbing perfect they'll get a shell yeah. or they'll get a dry in so there's so many things to learn from certifications to, you know, weight distribution on the trailer. You don't want to be throwing the bathroom into a place that won't work for the axles and tires. Or if you want to put a door somewhere, but that happens to be where the tires are go, you're going to need to change where the door goes. Yes. So all of those design considerations, then we work on build, park, and live in the dream. Is that all 
taught in your academy? Yes. Oh, awesome. Great. Yeah, we take so them through people, steps. Can people go to it now? Yeah, gotinyacademy.com is um, the place they can go. Nice. Well, let's give people a sneak, a sneak peek right, yes. of it. So tell us, like, what would be your best advice to someone that wants a tiny home? Definitely finding. So I have this three part of how to hire a builder, okay. you know, because, you know, you've worked with contractors here, multitasker. Like, how do you find someone, you know, their shows like Homes on Homes was all about contractors that didn't do it right. And they went in and fixed botched up things. I mean, those stories exist and people want to avoid them still do. <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> yep. So the same thing is true in this industry. I have this this sort of builder bid package. You got your questions you're going to ask. I have 40 questions, mm -hmm. you know, and then there's the design, even if written on paper. What is your design, especially if you're custom? And then there's also the materials you're going to specify. Because if you're going to get, you know, the full, you know, stainless steel appliance package versus your rental white, or if you're going to have the quartz countertop, the bathtub with the steam room and sauna, I mean, I see a lot of people pack it in because in my mind, I figure, well, if I'm going to go small, I want to increase the luxury. You know, I want to have the elements in the home down to like, I want to go get a hot tub that's one of those uh, soft tubs outside that you can, you <laughs> know, put the water in. a gold-plated hot tub. <laughs> exactly. So all of those pieces come together. That's the builder bid package. The other one is make sure your builder is certified. But it's not just any certification. Here in California, a lot of builders don't know that all this legalization there's a list from the California Housing and Urban Development called HUD uh, that is a third party verified list. If your certifier is not on that list and you go to permit and legally permit a home here in the city of San Diego, which has legalized it, and your certifier is not on that list, you're not getting permitted. But you don't know as the buyer about that list and about, I mean, these are some deeper, deeper dives, you know, I so call it. So it's a separate list than being a contractor? Exactly. And that builder really needs to make sure that that certification, it's really asking the client, where is your home going? Oh, we're going to go in the city of San Diego. I'm so excited. I heard about it being legalized. Well, then you need to make sure you're going to get this certain certification. Right now, Pacific West Tiny Homes is the only one on that list that's pretty much doing certifications in the industry of tiny homes on wheels or movable tiny homes. Great. So important stuff. Um, so yeah, so builder bid package certification and then really getting, you know, a gut check on the right, who your builder is. Like I even tell people, go look at their personal Facebook account, you know, go look at how they're communicating online. Definitely. May I have a 10 point checklist on the things that people need um, that I also offer. Nice. Great. And the Academy. In and, the Academy. and I'm assuming for your company. Yeah, there's well, so right? much. I mean, it was 10 weeks. So it was at least an hour each week. And all of that is now in a video package. People can choose to just do the video. But they also, the cool thing about the Academy is that I create this clinic where every week for 10 weeks, we gather on a Tuesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, and we meet each other and ask questions and go through some of the thoughts and considerations and challenges that they're facing. Great. So they're not so isolated trying to figure all the stuff out on their own. So, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. But let's say they want to, they don't want to do it and they want to hire you. So what, what would be the next step if they want to hire, you know, experienced tiny homes? What's I've pretty much turned it. I mean, I'll do some consulting, but my really strong suggestion go in the academy. Okay. You know, because they can get access to the videos, they get all the training. Um, what I'm finding, I started this 10 weeks ago with a group. The three women that are absolutely they've gotten quotes, they've gotten, you know, we have we've got a long um waiting list out there. There are builders that are one year out. So anyone that's oh, wow. like, I want a home in six months, like mm -hmm. Uh, good luck, because even the manufacturer, the big ones, the park model manufactured homes, they're often six months to year, a year out too. Wow. So our industry needs more scalability. We need some more influx of capital and scale uh, because they're, they're across the board. A year out is common. How many, you would say, manufacturers are out there right now? There's probably like 300 tiny home builders. Now, you've got everyone from, I'm going to do one and two mm -hmm. to, you know, one of the companies I just talked to was at, you know, Wind River Tiny Homes out in Tennessee. You know, they're making 25 custom handcrafted tiny homes, and they're looking to scale to 35. Okay. You compare that to a manufacturer of like manufacturer home, they're pumping out 15 a week. Yeah. Right? And their, their warehouses are huge. You know, we're talking... 
the tiny home companies have like one, two, three, or four bays, mm -hmm. you know, in, in an industrial park, kind of like we're in right now. But now you want to get to that, you know, 20 or 25 a week. Mm -hmm. that is, that's a scale. Yeah. <laughs> you need more capital. You need, need more exactly. demand. And not everyone's yeah. going to do that. There will always be the handcrafted custom builders. Um, there will always be the DIYers. We just want to make sure the DIYers are also building tiny homes to the safe you know, standards that all the other builders are building them to. Uh, we're a big community and believers of, you know, if you want to get a hybrid and build it your, the rest of yourself, if you want to hire someone to do it, but you want to have, you know, a hand in it, you know, we love the DIYers. We just really love quality built tiny homes. Last thing we want to hear is someone getting hurt, or you know, or a tiny home fell, burning. Something, yeah. yeah, burned. I agree. So as, you know, if we want to scale the market, right, as you said, you know, they're only fact, the biggest one so far, you said 25, 30 models uh, for the year, correct? And that's one builder. I mean, I, I we have not in the industry, we do not know actually of each other how many they're building per year. You know, I would imagine that other industry, the bigger, you know, they all know, right? Yeah. They know who's yeah, building. It's, it's a bit more mature. So it's exactly. more transparent. They've kind of learned yes. some things. And so if you want to scale though, like if, if as the tiny home lady, if I ask you, okay, I want to help you scale. Yes. What's the first thing we would, we would need to do to scale? What I would think? say a really strong attention to the buyer process. Okay. Because here's the thing, all of our builders out there, oh my goodness, the amount of handholding that has to happen. I love you people that want tiny homes. I love it, love you. I am you. However, there's some education that you need to go through because I want to protect my builders out there. I don't want them on the phone for hours and hours. They need to go be building. Now, granted, of course, as you build your team, have someone on the phone that knows enough about the build process to actually handle and communicate. When you're a smaller builder crew, you don't have a lot of people. You're Oftentimes, you're the builder that's answering phones and doing the marketing and building the home, you know? So you've got to really create for a scale, you got to create a team, right? You're great here, multitasker. I've seen you grow and, you know, evolve because you, you for the visions that you have, you've got to have a team to execute them. Correct. So definitely building team on um, its quality. And there's people out there that are passionate about this industry. They're coming from other industries. So we need to, you know, tap into the, the wealth of knowledge that's out there. Um, create, streamline the buyer process, mm -hmm. financing. Mm -hmm. That is a big one. We are dealing with an, a personal loan situation that is not meeting. So you got someone, let's just paint a picture. You got, you know, a woman named Sarah. She makes $60,000 a year at, you know, working a really good job. She's, she wants a tiny home, but the tiny home that she wants is probably an eight by 28 minimal, right? Not maybe so big at like a 40 footer. You're not getting bigger than 40. I've heard 45, but you know, 40 is pretty up there. And her home's going to cost eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. She might have $10,000 as a down payment because she saved up her, her money and all that, but she's not getting a loan mm -hmm. for whatever that math was, you know, for anything <laughs> beyond what she's making because she's got cost of living of she's got you know the debt to income ratio if she's got any debt yeah you know she came out of school a couple years ago so you know the loans are personal loans we need something to the equivalent of a mortgage type of loan you know the fannie mae fannie mac but they've got wheels so now it's a personal it's not a fixed, a fixed home Correct. right so yeah. we are we are running into that we i mean this industry would be so much bigger if we had a financial package, much like the solar industry, right? We started out with not many people had solar and now because financing got a hold of it. Mm -hmm. So I've thought of things like peer to peer financing. Mm -hmm. Let's put together a fund where, you know, no, Sarah is not going to, you know, get a personal loan anymore. She's going to get a loan from a group of people that say, yeah, given her experience and all her ability, She's going to pay that over the, you know, 12 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it won't be a personal loan, but, you know. I have some ideas. Okay, okay we'll good, because we need you. <laughs> yeah, okay, I have some ideas we can talk about. So financing is one. Mm -hmm. And then the final one would really be this builder network, this, um, you know, understanding who's really interested in getting those leads from those qualified buyers that have gone through the financing and all the approvals and all that that are ready for the home. They've gone through a virtual reality. This is the home that they want. We've got people, you know, that are teamed up to design that home because they're designers. They know weight distribution. They know trailer. They know all of that. And then they also know how to build a good home. 
So those are the pieces to be put together. I agree. So let's say we, we figure out financing, we yep. figure out the building. I think as the reason why we're doing virtual reality is because of the visual visualization of things, right? To be able to see things. And so one of the questions that I usually hear when it comes to smaller square foot uh, ADUs and tiny homes and mobile homes, it's always, oh, it just sounds small. Yeah, right? It sounds sure. like it's only 300 square feet. What do you mean? You know, I'm right. going to be able to fit my pet. Like yeah. people can't see no, what 300 can't. square feet looks like right mm -hmm. so uh just so we can kind of visually understand what are some of the like you already mentioned all the things you have in your feature sure in your tiny home but what are some of the save like some of the uh you know you can save uh customize the area yes. and the feel yes. of it what are some of the tips so or some the of the three area? top things are tall ceilings mm -hmm. so you may have a portion of your home that has a loft and that would be the smaller part but it's not covering up your whole home so as people walk into our home if we put the loft right as they walked in it would just be cramped it would be ridiculous but they get this tall 11 foot ceiling that are bigger than most regular homes right um, and then they can go and tuck under the loft in our little like nook where our couch and our office is. We're sitting down in those seats anyway, but in the kitchen where we're standing and we're walking around getting our, you know, breakfast ready, it's the tall ceiling. The second one is white, right? I don't care what shade, but go white. Go white and bright is going to open your home. You know, you can add texture, you can add splashes of color and all of those things. But if you want to do a full color, around you will just close it in now some people like the cave or the you know the really cozy nook and they'll put wood throughout their whole home you know we see that all the time mm -hmm. um it's just a choice you know it's feeling like for the people that really i don't want to feel that small this is this is for you the second one is multifunctional furniture mm -hmm. you know like i said we've got a, a desk that can go into like not a desk a table that folds four ways it can pop up for a two to three people it can pop up for an entire like six people sitting around it and it can drop completely down all of it away so we can have people walking around in the space. Nice. So that multifunctional Murphy beds, big use right there because you're going to drop a bed for when you sleep, sure. you know, and then put it back up and it could be a couch. It could be a desk because you're not, you know, typing and working when you're sleeping mm -hmm. or even a garage bed that comes down and then goes back up into the ceiling. Those are just some of the things, you know, desks that flip up and flip down. All of those features have really been used to make a small space functional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very good tips. Yeah. So what if, what if, you know, they, it sounds great. They go, I want, I want to save, you know, I, I, this sounds like great ideas, but I can't get financing, right? And oh. I can't get a tiny home. I'm in this apartment, but I, I want to be efficient with, with my area, with my space. What do you recommend? What other tips can they do if they can't get a tiny home? At that point i would say you know for people that live in in a home for people that want to go tiny and maybe they're living in a two three bedroom home or something like that and they're just the way their situation is start living in a just a couple rooms mm -hmm. in fact a lot of people make that choice when they realize you know i only go from the bathroom to the bedroom to the kitchen and you can shrink a lot of that space because some of it's just walk path you know it's not even what you're using you're just walking through a space mm -hmm. so you know get to you know know that you can even take chalk and draw out a space and and you know i don't know pull some furniture out on the on the driveway to get prepared for it but the biggest thing is to go stand inside them you know to go go and travel to there's a lot of airbnb tiny homes out there some are you know all different levels of, <laughs> of amenities. You're like, no one's like mine. No one's like mine. Well, some are, but, you know, location is key. You know, I, 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 love our, I love our location because I love our neighbors. But, you know, for us, we call it the urban tiny home. It's, it's got some density around it. But when you go inside the home, you get the flavor of the home. You know, one thing we really love about our home, our home has been in the deep canyon of Colorado mountains to the urban environment of Houston, Texas, nice. to you know, a, a, a farm ranch on, on, you know, in areas of Colorado and, and it always stays the same inside. Mm -hmm. Right. I know where my toothbrush is. I know where, so, you know, but not a lot of people travel. I would say they more so want homes. 95% of people want homes to just be able to move so that maybe they want to get closer to family. Maybe they, you know, some want to move, you know, every couple of years to a different lo location mm -hmm. because they just feel like life is, you know, spicier like that. And now with all this virtual, you know, workability, mm -hmm. 
you know, the millennials and the van life and the schoolies, you know, I know that's not the same as the tiny home world, but they call them tiny homes too. You know, when I'm in my RV camper, I call it my tiny home because what is a home, right? It's a place where you do your cleaning, your cooking, your sleeping and all of those things. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very good point. So Lindsay, tell me where, where has it been legalized so far? So legalization has been a passion of a few people and uh, that names have to be mentioned. Dan Fitzpatrick, the president of the Tiny Home Industry Association, has a long history in government. He was a city manager in the city of Las Vegas back in uh, the interesting mafia days and of the days of, of Las Vegas. And he also was the county administrator officer of County of Fresno. So he really knows the government side of things. And he also had 22 years background in developing. So he came to this world of tiny homes. You know, we we're so fortunate because when he meets with elected officials, whether they're county supervisors or council members, uh, you know, he's able to talk their language. And he has a, a fun fact that it took only 24 hours for the city of Fresno to approve tiny homes and backyards as ADUs because... Dan knew some people there, <laughs> but LA nice. took three years. And then we went on to city of San Diego. We've got the city of San Jose County of Santa Clara. That's a real unique thing. We got a lot of land coverage there, right in Silicon Valley. We also have the County of Humboldt mm -hmm. and the city of San Luis Obispo. Nice. So this is like, you know, the type of thing that the ordinances are catching on. People are starting to adopt them into language all over the country. Um, they'll pop up. And that's just the list that is legalized. There are many that are well on their way. Um, the county of Santa Cruz is interested in, in also looking at that. So everyone's at different stages. Uh, recently, we had the state of Maine approve tiny homes. So we are seeing from, you know, big county level to state level and, you know, it's not stopping. We're not stopping. Great. Well, it's legalized tiny. That's right? right. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it has been great talking to you, Lindsay. I know there's there'll be more talks to go. There's a lot of ideas I got today to see how we can help you out to scale this. I think there's a lot of need for it. I think there's a lot of people that want to have that liberty of, of being in their home, but actually moving. I, uh, you know, millennials, the more and more I, I hear that too, you know, they, they like to be free and just go everywhere. So I think tiny homes are a very good option for that. Absolutely. Um, but like you said, there's, there are some hurdles. Yes. So let's work together. Let's see what we can do. And let's work as a team to, to get more tiny homes going. Right. Absolutely. So where can people contact you? Where can they uh, find out more about tiny homes and contact Lindsay? Yeah, I'm on all that social world. So on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Experience Tiny Homes with an S. And I, you know, can be found at experiencetinyhomes.org because um, I like to organize. You know, I, I love the, the uh, my passion is for organizing people like that, that around their ideas and why they want to go tiny and their passion and turn their passion into reality. So the GoTinyAcademy.com is also a place, you know, if they really just want to get that thing started and, and learn more and be in community. I think that's the biggest thing. They get to learn from each other on the mission and on the journey. Not everyone has family members and friends that are going tiny. So it's great to find other people that are thinking a lot like they are. Um, you know, I was one of the only ones other than one other friend in our community of friends that was going tiny. So it's really great to gather together. And what people really like to do is they love to see tours of tiny home. You know, I've, it's before the virtual reality, you know, before they're really immersive experience, they're watching YouTube, they're, they're checking things out on TV. So we also have a tour of our tiny home and you can check that out on YouTube Nice at Experience Tiny Homes. All right. Well, why don't we check it out now? Yeah, let's do it. I'm here with our 33 foot long, 300 square foot tiny home, Sierra, let's go take a tour. And for listeners out there that wanna take a look at our tiny home and take a tour, go to YouTube and type in the search bar, experience tiny homes, and it will be the feature video right there. Take a tour with us of our tiny home. What, what do you think is the average like cost? For like your mobile Good mobile question. Mobile. Yeah, average cost uh, has changed a lot with all the building materials. You know, our industry is not, you know, no different than anyone else that's been affected. Mm -hmm. But I would say you're in the $300 a square foot, okay. you know, for a tiny home. The big, the big kicker is that trailer. Mm -hmm. You know, the park models and the manufactured homes, you know, obviously there's, there's a scale and, a, you know, economy of scale there. But with your handcrafted custom trailer, 
all of that, especially if you get into the gooseneck trailers, especially for people that want a bigger home, then you are getting into that, you know, higher price per square foot. And you also think about it, you know, in a big home, you have a bigger square footage, like a 2,500. You've got the most expensive part, which is the kitchen and all the appliances spread out amongst a bigger square footage. But in a tiny home, you have that same appliance package in a smaller square footage. So it's hard to compare it to a regular size home, of course. you know, because, because distribution of things. Exactly. Yeah, and sense. you're able to be portable. Yeah, that makes sense. How do we want to end this? Well, is there anything else you want to talk to us about? Well, or? what I'd really like to do is something that I often do when there's, you know, the the line out the door at these festivals. And I feel for people waiting in line 20 minutes. So I like to do a little tier. Do you want to join me? Let's do it. All right. So when I say go, you say tiny. Go. Tiny. Go. Tiny. When I say tiny, you say now. Tiny. Now. Tiny. Now. All right. Let's do Woo. It. <laughs> go tiny. Go now. Tiny homes. <laughs> and now our guest will experience Multitasker's virtual reality platform. The virtual reality session with Multitasker was amazing because a lot of what I do with my clients that want to go tiny, they want a custom home. They're looking at budgets of a hundred thousand or more, but you know, they're going to work with someone or, you know, maybe they're a builder and they're just going to get a flat image like on a computer screen. But when you put on goggles and you can literally look around, you can get up close to the handles on the cabinets that you choose. And then you can say, you know what? I don't think I want those cabinets to be white. Boop. And now you can look at it again and say, oh, that looks beautiful. Or what about that style? What about this type of flooring? All of those changes are way better to be made and ahead of time. So being able to see your home, your property, whether you're an investor or a homeowner, you can see the property and, and the, you know, the repair that you're doing, the the remodel that you're doing all before you actually sign the dotted line. Hey guys, thank you for joining Multitaskers Home Solution Network podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please click on subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our next podcast. Remember, every single podcast, we're going to give you different advice on how to save time, how to save money, and how to create value. Check us out at goldmultitasker.com. Click subscribe.